Hi everyone, I'm Josh Mitchell. I'm the science communicator at Open Force Field, and today we're going to prepare a protein for simulation in Scratch with free and open source software. So the point of this workshop is not really to give everyone a robust uh, methodology for preparing proteins. We just want to show what's possible with open source tools and show off how great Jupyter Notebooks are for this sort of workflow. Jupyter Notebooks are really fantastic. They let us keep a record of exactly what we do. Uh, the record is in code, so it's easily reproducible. You can copy a notebook, modify it a little bit, and then that's your new workflow for a slightly changed system. And they're interactive, so uh, there's lots of visualization opportunities, and uh, you can just uh, keep running code until you get the result that you want. And then you have a record of the code you ran. So what can we do in this notebook? We're going to first take a protein from the PDB. We've tried to pick one that's especially difficult. So it's missing loops, missing residues, missing atoms. Um, and we're going to uh, repair it, trim it, cap it, return non-standard amino acids to what was translated, titrate protonation states, dock a small molecule, solvate, parameterize, and simulate it. Uh, so we're going to use PDB Fixer for repairing and mutating. PDB Fixer can do most of these steps automatically as long as the missing parts or the correct are included in the PDB header. If not, I'll show you briefly how you can manually tell PDB Fixer about them. Um, also, PDB Fixer doesn't do anything particularly clever to restore loop structures, so don't expect them to be particularly high quality. We'll be converting all the proteins to canonical amino acids, and we'll be keeping crystallographic waters. Uh, what, what can't we do? We can't do non-standard amino acids and post-translational modifications. Uh, uh, this is the limitation at the moment of our force fields and our uh, OpenFF tools for parameterizing things. It's a limitation that we are actively working on lifting, and you can see a demonstration of that in our Things to Make and Do workshop. We also can't do metalloproteins. Uh, this is partially because uh, metals other than a few uh, monovalent uh, ions are very difficult to do in molecular mechanics. Um, and we can't do biopolymers other than proteins, again, because we don't have the force fields. Uh, and, and lipids is the same thing. Our, our, we have a small molecule force field, but it's not been optimized for lipids and we're not sure that it gives results. What's a bit tricky, disulfide bonds are a bit of a hole in the system. Uh, if they're in the PDB Connect record, they'll be detected. If they're not in the PDB Connect record, they might be detected from proximity. Uh, and I'll show you a way to check what disulfide bonds are there. But if you want to put a disulfide bond in that uh, we don't detect automatically, that's going to be an exercise for you to figure out. So first we're just going to load some utility functions for visualization and then we're going to choose and download a PDB. So I've done a big search for PDBs that were really difficult to prepare automatically uh, and I found this 5AP1 and so we're just going to grab that. Not very interested in what it actually is. So we're just downloading that uh, fresh so that I can prove that I haven't prepared this in advance. Um, and then we're going to load it into PDB, PDB Fixer and visualize it. So you can see here, we've got a whole bunch of crystallographic waters. We've got a protein that's missing some loops. Uh, we have a ligand, which we'll, uh, we'll, we'll deal with in a, a, towards the end of the workshop. And then we have a couple of crystallographic artifacts or um, co-crystallization molecules. We also have these three uh, magnesium atoms. Um, if you look at the periodic image of this, um, there's about 10 magnesium atoms in, in this area, and there's no mention in the literature that I could find about this protein being dependent on magnesium. So I think this is some sort of crystallization artifact. These don't represent magnesium. So we won't be simulating this protein with magnesiums. We're also going to throw away this ligand and redock the same ligand so that I can show you that we can actually do docking. Uh, and because it's slightly easier than trying to protonate um, an unknown ligand in, uh, well, automatically. 
Okay, so the first thing we're going to do is repair the protein model. And that starts by identifying missing loops. So this find missing residues function uh, goes through the uh, PDB header and identifies where there are loops missing. So we can see in red is uh, an N terminal loop that's missing from the crystal structure, and then green, blue, and uh, green and blue are both missing loops from the interior of the protein, and purple is from the uh, C terminus. We can see there's a couple of other residues that seem to be missing, like this loop here. Uh, that's because um, our visualization tool isn't representing non-standard amino acids, and this is just non-standard amino acids. So we'll, we'll sort that out in a moment. So find missing residues stores the residues it finds in this dictionary. Uh, and we can modify this dictionary to change what gets fixed. So in particular, we can re remove the, the terminal loops and replace them with caps so that we don't have to try and reconstruct a large uh, terminal loop. So this is how we're doing that. We're just looping over each chain, cutting off the uh, terminal loops and replacing them with ACE and NME. And so we're just changing the fixes missing residue attribute directly and uh, and and so now we've got a much simpler uh, set of loops to replace. Um, if you know there's a missing loop but PDB fixer couldn't detect it, again you can uh, fix that by telling PDB fixer about it in this uh, in, in this dictionary. Um, and so now once we've made that modification we can again check what it's going to do. And we can see it's still got all the same colors, but now the terminal loops are ACE and NME. So that's a acetyl group and an N-methyl group. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is standardize non-standard residues. So this PDB has a whole bunch of phosphorylated residues. Um, we don't have parameters for phosph phosphorylated residues, so we're going to return them to their standard uh, original residue counterparts. So the first thing to do, we use PDB fixes find non-standard residues, and that sets this fixer.nonstandard residue um, list up with uh, the residues and what we want to change them to. Uh, so for instance, we could append to this uh, a residue that we index into and then say, I want to change this residue to glycine, and that would let us make a mutation. But we're not going to do that. Uh, instead, we're just going to have a look at what it's come up with. And so what we're doing here is we're just identifying the residues that it's determined are non-standard and we're visualizing these. So we can see there's a bunch of phosphothreonines and also a phosphoserine. You can see that's that missing loop and that extra little bit of the, the other loop there. Okay, so... Uh, we haven't actually so far made any changes to the model, uh, and now's the first time we're gonna make a change to the model. So what we're gonna do is call this fixer.replace non-standard residues function. It's gonna go through the whole protein, identify any, pro any residues that we've asked it to change, rename those residues, and delete any atoms that shouldn't be there. And so this sort of transforms uh, those non-canonical residues into ordinary residues that are missing some atoms. Um, so if we then visualize that again, we can see that those uh, phosphor groups are gone. Okay, so now we're going to move, remove non-biopolymer components. So this is, these are called heterogens in PDB parlance. So this will remove everything that's not basically a DNA, RNA, or protein macromolecule. Uh, so that, in this case, is going to be our magnesiums. Um, our crystallographic artifacts, uh, and our ligand. So we'll remove that and have another look, and we can see we've just got protein and water left now. And we can see again that this loop has been repaired. Okay, now we're going to check the disulfide bonds, uh, just to make sure that we've detected all the ones we, we expect. This isn't particularly important for this particular molecule, but if you're to following along with your own PDB file, then you might want to double check the disulfides that you expect to 
uh, to be there are there. And so all I'm doing here is just looping over all of the bonds, identifying bonds between sulfurs, and then uh, drawing them uh, and, and listing them. So we can see there have been no disulfide bonds detected. And if we look at um, we look at the disulfides, we can see that that doesn't look too heinous. We might be able to, to say that there should be a disulfide bond here, but it's clearly not in this particular confirmation. Okay, so we've got all our metadata together. PDB Fixer now knows how it's going to repair the protein. So uh, it now has to find the missing atoms um, and then we can see where it's going to add atoms in. And so you can see there's now quite a list of places to return atoms to. So many of these are entirely missing loops. Some of them are uh, residues that have missing atoms and some of them are those phosphorylated residues um, that we were looking at earlier. And we can see that the whole protein is really pockmarked with these residues that are missing. Okay, and then we can actually add them in uh, with this fixer.add missing atoms. So this will actually action all of the atoms that we've identified as missing uh, previously. And then once that's done, we can visualize it. Now in green, I've colored in uh, where loops have been repaired. Um, and then all of those residues uh, are now complete, except for hydrogens, which we'll add. Okay. Um, if you trust PDB Fixer and you just want to do all of this in one step, you can uh, uncomment this uh, cell and run it, and uh, that will do all the same things that we've just done uh, in one big step. Okay, now protonation. So we're going to first protonate with PDB Fixer, which is perfectly good at protonating everything with the standard. Um, ionization states at a given pH, but it doesn't consider the local state of each residue to determine like a specific pKa. Um, however, it's much better than the other tool we're going to use at actually coming up with decent starting points for the hydrogen coordinates. So we're going to use PDB Fixer to give us initial coordinates for all the hydrogens, especially important for the crystallographic waters. Um, and then we're going to use a tool called ProPKa to actually add the remaining hydrogens. Okay, so we run that, uh, shouldn't take too long. And then uh, we're now going to carefully calculate pKa's for each residue and, and protonate according to that. So this is a relatively complicated cell, even though it's only a few lines. First thing we're doing is taking the fixer topology and positions and writing them out to a PDB. And then we're using this exclamation mark syntax to run PDB2PQR. So PDB2PQR is a program designed for preparing uh, PDBs for Poisson-Boltzmann calculations. But we're going to use it as a front end to uh, ProPKA, which calculates PKAs for, for residues. Uh, so this exclamation mark syntax says to Jupyter, um, this isn't a Python command, it's actually a shell command. I want you to run this command in the shell. And this is really a wonderful feature of Jupyter because it means that if you have a few steps in your procedure that you can't do in Python, but you can do with some shell command, you can just incorporate that straight into your Jupyter notebook. And in fact, you can even take variables from Python and put them into uh, into your shell command. So here, this pH variable comes straight from up here. Um, and these curly brackets symbolize, oh, this is a variable. So we're just running pdb to pqr on, with the given pH and uh, the given uh, file names that we've determined previously. So we're going to run this pdb to pqr command. We can see it finishes very quickly and it's produced a new PDB file, um, PDB ID protonated. Okay, um, so now we can visualize that new structure file 
uh, the same way as we did before. And we can now see that we have a full protein complete with beautiful hydrogens. Um, waters are all hydrogenated, protonated rather. Uh, and, and so that's our protein ready to solvate, or ready to dock rather. So the next thing we're going to do is dock that ligand back in. Um, obviously it would be probably simpler to find a way to just add hydrogens to the ligand, but we want to actually demonstrate that we can dock things. So, uh, so we're going to just dock the, the ligand back in. And um, since we haven't done any energy minimization or anything, protein's actually like perfectly set up to, um, to dock the ligand. So it'll actually dock straight into the right position, which is very nice. Okay, we're going to use um, Autodoc Vena for docking. So Autodoc Vena is like the classic multi-threaded open source uh, docking software. Um, it's getting a bit old now, but still works. And, and we're gonna use it as a demonstration. I've written a, a wrapper around it to make it a bit easy to use in Python. Um, and so the first thing we need to do is just create a target from this protonated PDB. So we can do that and visualize it. Uh, and so we can see there's the water and the PDB. So now we're going to position the search space for docking. So this is obviously a big thing in docking. You need to know basically where the binding site is so that you can search through it. Um, Autodoc Vena does a grid search um, at like progressively finer levels of detail. We can use this as an opportunity to demonstrate how great Jupyter's interactivity features are. So this visualize function just visualizes the protein in the usual way that we've been doing with this 3D software called NGLView draws an axis on it so that we can sort of orient ourselves in space. Uh, and then it lets us draw where the center and the size of the target is. And I happen to know because we've seen the crystal structure that the docking pocket is over here. And if I just move the center of this box, we can get it right in place. And so this is one of the really great ways that you can create interactivity with Jupyter Notebooks. You don't need any special coding skills. You don't need to know how to get a UI that's interactive. You just need a way to visualize the state of your configuration and to change that state and revisualize it until it looks the way you want it. Um, and this is just uh, really fantastic. So this sort of high quality configurable 3D um, UIs that don't take any particular skill to write. So now we will create the ligand and dock it. Now, because of some technical details that are sort of beyond the scope of this talk, whatever ligand we dock will be titrated to the appropriate pH by, by this step. Um, so we're using a neutral ligand that uh, will be a neutral ligand after titration. So we don't have any issues, but if you produce a charged ligand, you might have some issues. Okay, so we can write a smiles in, and this is the molecule that we have, and we can just write it up and draw it and say, yep, that's the molecule I want. And then we can just say target.doc ligand at this pH and get some scores. Okay, so we can see uh, the higher scoring pose is minus 8.3, that's this. And it's got the cyclohexane buried in the pocket, pointing towards this loop, just as it did in the crystal structure. And we can see that there are lots of different poses um, and they have all of these different energies. And uh, we'll just go with the, the top pose because we know it's correct. Okay, so next step is to solvate this structure. Uh, PDB fixer can do solvating as well. Um, there's one trick with PDB fixer, which is that the way it solvates is using OpenMM's modeler. And OpenMM's modeler uses a force field to decide how to neutralize a system. And if that force field isn't clever enough to figure out uh, what charge your molecule is, it will come up with the wrong charge for the system. Because uh, it uses 
very basic bare bones force field that's really just designed to get van der Waals parameters in place for solvation. So if your ligand is not neutral or it's not neutral after it's been docked uh, with that titration trick, you might need to do some extra work to, to neutralize your simulation box. Uh, my recommendation is that you just delete sodium or chloride ions until you get the desired charge. And then once we simulate with, uh, with constant pressure, the, the box size will, will equilibrate very quickly. So what we're gonna do is add solvent. Uh, we're gonna give it uh, two nanometers of padding, which is about right for a amber or open FF force field. You could get, probably get away with a little less. We're defining sodium and chloride as the ions. We're asking for a hundred millimolar ionic strength, and we're asking for a dodecahedral box. I think you should always use dodecahedral box. You can basically think of it as rectangular boxes that have been shifted in in parallel planes so that the center of one box is above the corner of the other box. And basically the way it works out is that you only need about 70 something percent of the volume to achieve the same padding distance uh, for a spherical solid. So uh, much better than cubic boxes, use a dodecahedron for everything I reckon. Then we're just gonna place the corner of the box at the origin with some NumPy maths and write it out to a PDB file and visualize it. Okay, so this is our newly solvated system. Uh, you can see that the bonds here aren't drawn. Don't worry, that's just a bug in the way that PDB Fixer and NGL view talk to each other. So you can see that we've got uh, water in what looks like a rectangular prism box, but you can see with these uh, box vectors that this corner in the periodic image above is actually shifted by half a box which is very neat because it means that uh, the distance between these, if they were one on top of the other, would be very small, but because the corner is actually there, uh, periodic image is, is very big. So this is the rectangular prism representation of a dodecahedral box. And we can see that our ligand is docked here and all of our water is there. We can even see the caps that NGLView doesn't know how to represent as part of the protein. Okay, so solvated, salted, dodecahedrolated, docked, protonated. Now let's parameterize. We're going to use OpenFF tools to load the prepared PDB and prepare the simulation. Usually the best way to load a system into the toolkit is with this from PDB method that I'm about to show you. And then any molecules that basically aren't water or proteins, you need to give in this unique molecules argument so that uh, the PDB can identify them because PDBs are very famously not very good at telling you what a chemical is. So the toolkit by default knows how to read proteins composed of the 20 canonical amino acids plus and methyl and acetyl caps, water, and common monatomic and monovalent ions. Um, and there's upcoming support for some more stuff, but we're not there yet. And we're not even gonna try with radicals. Um, our logic is basically that if you're doing radicals in molecular mechanics, you're not gonna get the right answer anyway. So there aren't any force fields for radicals. And it's really easy to accidentally come up with a radical, right? You mean to do a regular molecule, a stable molecule, and you accidentally do a, miss a hydrogen, or add an extra hydrogen, and then you have a radical. So we don't support radicals. We don't plan to support radicals. If you give us a radical, we will tell you that you've probably done something wrong. Okay, so we just uh, load the topology with topology from PDB. We put our prepared PDB in and tell it um, the only molecule you don't recognize is this ligand, and then we can visualize it. Now, once we've loaded this, we're going to parameterize it with a Smirnoff force field. Check out our video uh, about how Smirnoff works. Uh, basically, the idea behind Smirnoff is that we use Smirk's patterns to directly parameterize chemistry rather than going through atom types. So we're not going to do atom types at all. Okay, and this is the same system as before, but you can see now that all the waters actually look like waters, which is great. Okay, since I last performed this workshop, uh, we've updated Sage um, and we've updated Lambert too. Uh, so let's use the most up-to-date force fields. 
we're loading Sage as generic parameters, and then we're using Amber as specific parameters. So where the Amber parameters match, then the Amber parameter will get used. And what that means in practice is that we'll use the Amber parameters for proteins and the Sage parameters for everything else. Now, this will take a minute because it has to parameterize that ligand. Uh, but actually, it'll take about two and a half minutes. So while that's going, I can talk a bit more about Shmernoff. Uh, so all of our force fields use semantic versioning, uh, which is this 2.x.y thing. Um, and the idea there is that every time we make a small change to the force field, we'll update the version number. If you want to load one of our force fields, you need to write the version number somewhere because they're all named with the version number. And then if you have a script that loads a force field, you have a script that records exactly the parameters that we use because it records that version number. So Sage is parameterized on general medicinal chemistry, so it could parameterize proteins and lipids and all that stuff, but uh, hasn't been trained on them. Uh, and so we don't think it's really appropriate. Uh, so that's why we're using this AMBER port. Uh, the upcoming version 3.x.y rosemary force fields are planned to support proteins. Uh, so if you're going to use this in production with proteins, might want to wait for that. Um, uh, but for the moment, Sage can work on small molecules and ions with uh, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, phosphorus, sulfur, uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, and iodine. It uses tip 3 p water. It can do the same monotonic ions as the toolkit can, and it can also do monotonic xenon. Um, we don't yet support uh, bonds between anything apart from those uh, organic elements, uh, other monatomic ions, or proteins, biopolymers, or lipid membranes. If you have an OpenFF topology and convert it into an interchange by applying a force field, that interchange can then export parameters to a whole range of engines. So the idea there is no one has to implement Smirnoff force fields for their engine. Instead, uh, we can just spit them out from interchange. This should be nearly done. Right on cue. Okay. So we're now going to do a relatively detailed preparation uh, in OpenMM. I'm not saying that this is like appropriate for your production runs. In particular, every part of it is way too short, but it sort of demonstrates the basic process of setting up an MD simulation. We're going to use a Longevin middle integrator at room temperature, uh, give it a, an appropriate uh, time step and friction constant for the, the launch of a thermostat, uh, and then use that to create an open and simulation object with interchange. So interchange could also produce Gromax, Lamps, or Amber simulation uh, input files. So if OpenMM is not your favorite MD engine, don't be discouraged. Uh, but I really like OpenM for how easy it is to use in a Jupyter notebook. Okay, now we're going to energy minimize. So we do this to ensure that all the forces are small enough to integrate. Otherwise, your system's going to blow up. So this is just a little function to describe the, uh, how much energy and force the, the state has. Then we minimize and look at it again. This takes about a minute. So the original state, we can see quite low energy, um, but very high force. So if we tried to simulate this, it would immediately blow up. And now that it's minimized, it's got a much more reasonable force that, that can actually be integrated safely with a two fifth a second time step. All right, so the next step is equilibration. Everyone has a different idea about how to equilibrate. The way we're going to do it is we're going to put position restraints on the protein heavy atoms. So what that does is we just put a harmonic potential between each heavy atom at its uh, original position. Um, then we'll let the system bounce around for a bit. OpenMM is really great because it really lets you just like write down whatever uh, formula you want and then turn it into a potential. So it, OpenMM doesn't have explicit support for position restraints, but it has this custom external force that can just put position restraints on it if you know what you're doing. So all we're doing here is we're adding a global parameter which parameterizes all of the position restraints and that's the position restraint force constant. Then we're adding a for every particle, we're adding coordinates, which are just the original starting positions of those atoms. And then we're putting a harmonic 
uh, force onto all of those atoms. Uh, and then we have to restart, re reinitialize the context uh, because the, the forces have changed. Okay, so now we have a system with position restraints. We set the velocities to our integrated temperature and we'll run 100 picoseconds of simulation. This is the sort of thing where like, you might as well do a nanosecond, <laughs> uh, but I'm gonna do 100 picoseconds because I don't wanna wait too long for this demonstration. No one really knows what they're doing with equilibration. Um, your system's never going to really equilibrate until halfway through your production run most of the time. So it's not too crucial that you get equilibration right, but doing this properly can, uh, can get you to equilibrate a little bit faster. So now we're going to add a barostat. Uh, so this is a constant pressure simulation after we add this. Um, so we're now running an NPT uh, equilibration. Um, do that for another 100 picoseconds. Uh, and that'll let the box size relax down to something appropriate. We've left the position restraints on for this, and then we'll remove them the next step. Okay, so now we're going to remove the position restraints just by removing that force that we added in the first place. And now we're going to run a production run, which is definitely not long enough to be a production run. You probably want to run this on a supercomputer and you want to run it much longer than a minute of wall time. You want to run it for you know hundreds of nanoseconds or, or microseconds. Uh, but, but this is basically what it looks like. So we will add an XTC reporter to record a compressed trajectory of where we've been. Because OpenMM supports this unit system, we can actually express the report interval in units of time rather than simulation steps. Then we can uh, add a checkpoint reporter for exact continuations if we crash, and we can even uh, write our state to a CSV. So these reporters uh, get added to the simulation and then they get called every however many steps. Um, and then we run our production run, which is not long enough to use for production, but this great run for clock time uh, method lets us just say this will be a one minute simulation on any computer that you run this line. Okay, and now we can visualize this. So, so here's our big beautiful protein that we're now familiar with. Um, here's our ligand tucked in that binding pocket. And we can just play through the trajectory using NGL view. And that's our wiggling jiggling protein, fresh uh, built from the PDB using nothing but free and open source software uh, and an open force field, force field. Great. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed that. I hope that's gotten, you've gotten something out of that. I uh, hope you're excited about Jupyter Notebooks and open force field and open source stuff. Um, uh, we'd love it if you check out docs.openforcefield.org uh, and especially the examples page that has all sorts of examples uh, of how to use open force field tools um, and also check out our other workshops uh, and videos uh, on this YouTube channel. I uh, hope you enjoyed that. Thanks. See you next time.